So welcome to all of you tonight, and I'm, I'm glad that we had another classroom. It's nice that I teach here. I just said, well, let's go down these pieces. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, and so thank you for coming out, especially on a, a cold, wet night like tonight. And uh, I just finished this uh, slideshow um, PowerPoint uh, at the quarter to seven. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been spending the last afternoon putting the slides in. Yeah, no, yeah, no. And, uh, so uh, it's done, and I, I can't wait to present it. Um, <clears throat> so the first, uh, the last time I had been to Iceland was in 1970. That's when I took my first job as a university professor in Switzerland. And so I flew from uh, here to Iceland on Icelandic Air and stayed there. And then I had back, been back until last summer. The Smithsonian hired me. Uh, and so I taught a class for the Smithsonian. Uh, and, and so you're going to see some of the photos that are from here. So this is one, one of the lectures I completely modified and added a whole bunch of slides that I took last summer uh, to this. But, uh, for Iceland, Iceland is a mecca for geologists. It's the land of fire and ice. It's the land of volcanoes and glaciers, and it's just got an incredible story, and that's what I want to tell you there. But because of my Scandinavian roots, it also has culturally an incredibly uh, interesting history that we've got there. And, and so uh, tonight I'm going to deal with a little of that, too. So um, we're going to turn down the lights and... Uh, and talk a little bit about Iceland, uh, the land of fire and ice. And so what I'm going to do tonight, first of all, uh, is held together by geology, but at the same time there's a lot of culture in between. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about why is it interesting. It's on a mid-Atlantic rim. Uh, and there are places in the country where you can put your feet down and one foot's going towards Europe and the other towards North America. Very exciting. Also, lots of volcanism that is related to that. Uh, and so lots of volcanoes, one of the types of uh, uh, rocks that you've got there related to that, earthquakes, geothermal energy is incredible. Uh, and they use it for producing uh, most of the energy in the country. Glaciers are everywhere. Waterfalls. I had probably 200 photos of waterfalls and they are just <laughs> all incredible. I had to cut off one of them. And then uh, uh, a few years ago, 2010, we had the eruption of Eyjafjallajökull. the Yokel. Uh, which is this, uh, Oli, my, uh, my guy that was, uh, I worked with there, he said, Scott, we're not allowing you to leave this country until you can pronounce that. Uh, and then shut down the airways. And then I'll mention a little bit about the plants, animals, and the humans there uh, along the way. So that's what we're going to deal with. So here's a map of Iceland in the North uh, Atlantic Ocean. And the main island is here. Uh, and so Reykjavik, where maybe 70-80% of the population lives, is down here. When you fly in, you fly in right out here. Uh, and there's a ring road that goes around the country. And, and a lot of people, when they go and spend a week, they will take the ring road and see different things that are there. So I'm going uh, uh, to show you a little bit out here in this peninsula out here. We're going to go all the way up here. Mietvatten is one of my most favorite places in the country up here because the Mid-Atlantic Ridge comes right down through here. Selfoss is here. The, the largest glacier in Europe is there, Vatten Yokel. Uh, AF the Yokel is down in this area. Westerman Islands. Hey May and Surtsey are down here. So I mean, those are some things that I will be mentioning. The, the geyser is here. Gulf Foss is here with the, one of the most beautiful waterfalls. My, my favorite photo that I took there. Uh, and then Thingvellir, the, the uh, site of the oldest parliament uh, in the world. The oldest democratic uh, uh, parliament, uh, 935 AD, is right in this area here, right, right in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. So this is kind of the country, and we're going to make, make our way around as we go there. So first of all, if we go back in time, uh, 250 million years ago, all the continents were together, one supercontinent called Pangaea. And with time, they have been moving apart, because there are places where cracks have happened, magma is coming up to the surface and forcing the plates off to the side. And magma uh, comes up and taxes itself to the plate, more magma comes up, and it forces it off to the side. And so. Uh, <laughs> North America and Asia have been separated and have created the North Atlantic Ocean. So right out here in the middle is Iceland. Oh, uh, and, and so today, here is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. North America is moving in this direction. Europe is moving in that direction. And there is Iceland right there. 
Uh, and it is a hot spot. It is one of the 35 hot spots that's found around the world where magma is coming from the magma all the way up to the surface, uh, uh, from the mantle. And why, we don't know, but it is a place where there is a lot of very, what we call, mafic magma, magma that is basalt that is generated in those places. And so that whole island is a result of, of that. And, and so we are here in North America moving in this direction. We have a little wand if you can play off of the coast, but we're going to be focusing out here in the middle part of the Atlantic and taking a look out there. So here, if we took all of the ocean away and we went down to the bottom of the ocean, we would have the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Uh, and this is where the rocks are going in this direction here and in this direction here. Uh, and that's what we have. So Iceland as a country is about the size of Ohio. So it's just almost 40,000 square miles that you've got. Highest point in the country is just about 7,000 feet in elevation. Uh, and it's only 180 miles from the Arctic Circle, so not very far away. Population of the whole country, 325,000 people uh, that are here. We have Anna back here. Raise your hand, Anna. She's Icelandic, so she's going to help me with any of the pronunciation. Do we have any other Icelanders here? We may have, yeah, all right. So we did what, one more. Good. Uh, but uh, if you'll, you'll see that a lot of the photos, 80% of the country is not populated. Uh, and it is amazingly beautiful. The climate is very moderate. And the reason is you've got the, uh, the, the North Atlantic current that comes up from the Gulf. And the average temperature in Reykjavik uh, in, in January is 31 degrees. That's right around freezing. And the average temperature in the summertime is 52 degrees. And your precipitation 40 to 60 inches, so they get more rain than we get here in Portland. I love the names. They are long. Oh my God, wherever you go. And, and I say, holy, uh, you know, how do you pronounce that? And it's a, how do you pronounce that? Raivar Kapnar Good. I think the most, the most important one to learn in the country is this one the snurty. This is your toilet. Where is the snurty? <laughs> So, back to the tectonics. So here is the country, here is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge coming down here and it kind of diverts over right through Reykjavik. And there, there are these big cracks and everything is going on this side towards Europe and this side towards North America. Uh, and then Thingvellir is the one that is, is the area right down here. This is where the, the fir, uh, first parliament uh, originated. And so, <coughs> This whole valley, that side is going towards Europe, this side is going towards North America. Uh, and, and this is, is right down here where the very, very first parliament started. Right down in this area right here. So we got a chance to not only see geology, but also see democracy, the oldest democracy. This is what it looked like in those days as all of the Vikings that had come over from Norway and well, what is now Norway today and inhabited there, they would get together every year for their parliament. So let's talk a little bit about the volcanoes that are very, very famous there. There are over 100 volcanoes that are found there. 35 of them are active. What's an active volcano? It means that it's gone off in the last 10,000 years. Uh, and, and, and in Iceland, about every five years, they have a volcanic eruption that is going on. And so it's, it's very, and most of them, because it is mafic magma, it is not violent, and they are tourist eruptions, as they call it. And you can get fairly close and get really great photos. I'll show you some of these later on. Uh, and the island was born about 20 million years ago. And the age of the rocks, really, at the surface, are about six, anywhere from 7 to 16 million years. About a quarter of the country. Uh, is actually on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and then the rest of it is related to this hot spot that you have got. Oldest rocks are on the east side and the west side. Why? Because they've been moving away, and we'll show you a little bit more about that. So a lot of times what you will have is a fissure, a big crack in the ground, and the magma will come up along it, and it, because it is basaltic, there'll be little, uh, little cones just like this, cinder cones that are all along there, as you can see in this direction here. Uh, and wherever you go in the country, you can see old flows, young flows that are here, and where one flow has come in on top of another. Or when you get down towards the coast, you can see this is a younger flow that actually came out of this little uh, little uh, uh, cinder cone here, and this is a much older flow. The older flows, that's where they throw most of their hay. 
Uh, and there are some very famous volcanoes, but Hecla is one of them. Uh, and I'll come back to the, uh, to, uh, they had an eruption that uh, killed an awful lot of people, and so we'll talk a little bit about that coming up in a second. But Mivatan, this is the place up in the north, it's right on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, uh, is a really, it's, I just love this valley. Not only because of all the uh, geology, but also the uh, animals that are there. But they had an incredible set of eruptions from 1724 to 1729. They buried a whole bunch of farms, and, uh, they, and there was a lot of flows coming right down into the village, right towards the church. The people prayed and prayed and prayed, and the lava flow diverted and went around the church and saved it. I'll show you a picture. Uh, and then, uh, because they're on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, they have a lot of geothermal, a lot of hot water that's coming up to the surface. They have geothermal plants there. And there are a lot of other things that we'll show you in that area there. Mount Krafla, uh, uh, that is in the area, has erupted quite a few times in that area. But here in the valley, you have these incredible cinder cones that are gigantic in size one after another after another. And this is a smaller one that is in, uh, in the lake that you have got. And if, if you touch the uh, uh, temperature of the rocks, as you uh, get very close to some of the fumaroles, you can see the steam coming up right there, it is hot. Uh, as the first, when we arrived in the Mivatan Valley, the first thing we did is we stopped here. These are uh, false craters. They look like little cinder cones here, but they actually are a result of magma coming out underneath the lake that was there at one time. And they formed, uh, they call them pseudo craters that are there. And also with this geothermal energy there, they made bread. Uh, and it is absolutely dark and beautiful. And so these, they, these are stuffed with cans that they cook the bread. And so here, I'm eating uh, Atlantic char here with the dark bread underneath. Oh my God, was that a great lunch. It was, it was uh, the bake in that uh, oven that they have got. Here's my wife, Glenda, on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Her flat foot's going that way, and that's going towards Europe. This one is going towards North America. Here's the church. You can see the lava flow coming right down like this, and it just diverted off this direction and went around the other side. Uh, and inside, right on the altar they have, uh, there is the church, and there is the lava flow going around, and they were saved by prayer. <coughs> now, also in the Mibot Valley uh, is a, a geological wonderland area, but it's supposed to be the home of the Eula lands. You see, uh, in Iceland, there's no Santa Claus or equivalent that they've got. <laughs> Father Christmas, etc. They just have the five Eula lads. These are crazy guys. <laughs> uh, they live in these rocks. And, and, and they're supposed to live in two different places in, in the country. And so we visit for them. And these are some pictures of, of them. And uh, I bought Christmas tree ornaments of the Eula lads, all five of them. And they are really cute. Uh, and, and so it's a different tradition, a cultural tradition that is there. They, they, one of their two homes is the Mibon Valley. Also, we got a chance to, to climb volcanoes. Uh, and so and this is another one of these areas uh, with a fault here. And there's a cinder cone there. There's another cinder cone, in fact, four or five in a row. So I took the whole group out. And so I said, all right, we started. This was uh, at 8.30 in the morning. I said, let's get the blood running. And so there is a nice trail up to the top and then a couple stairs inside. So we went up to the top. Here we are in this inside of the cinder cone. And then you hike all the way up to the top. You look down, and there's another cinder cone here. And there are a couple in back of them. So wherever you go in the country, you've got cinder cones and other types of volcanoes that are there. Uh, now, an interesting eruption occurred uh, of uh, the Lackey Volcano. This was uh, 1783. Uh, and, uh, and again, it was in a whole line. So there were a whole bunch of volcanoes that were, uh, created this. But the, it, the, if you take the volume of all of the magma that came out, and this is a little tiny island, uh, it is... Uh, it was basically three cubic miles, 30 billion tons of lava. Uh, and so it is the largest volume of a flow in modern history uh, on land, not in the ocean that we have found. 130 craters were formed. This is back down uh, towards Reykjavik. But at the same time, a huge amount of fog, haze, was created from this. And uh, it was loaded with sulfuric acid. 
Uh, and, and, and so people were breathing it, livestock were breathing it, and it killed 20% of the population. Uh, you can imagine 130 volcanoes going off and all of this occurring. 50% of the livestock and a disastrous famine occurred in this. And historically, an incredible problem. And these things could happen again in the future. But historically, this was their biggest natural disaster that they have ever had there. Now, this is one of the um, one of the craters, of one of the 130 craters that you have. And this is another one uh, in that long chain. And also, I wanted to mention Surtsey Volcano back in 1964, uh, just south of the Westman Islands. A volcano erupted and an island came out of the ocean. This was back when I was learning geology. And I still remember the movies that we saw of Circe coming to life. Uh, and uh, it, it has been, uh, many, many geologists have visited it. And then, now the biologists are coming and visiting it. Uh, and they're looking at succession and what plants come in first, second, and third. You know what the first plant that came in on this little island? Tomatoes. <laughs> the geologist uh, didn't quite finish his tomato sandwich and threw it away, and the seeds went out and vegetated, and so that blew the minds of the biologist. <laughs> uh, and then, uh, and then here is searching just from a distance. So that is, that was one of the world famous volcanoes there. But the one that is, I mean, there uh, is Hime. So this is in the West of Islands, and I got a chance to to go out and uh, visit it and then climb right to the top of the volcano that erupted. Uh, and uh, this is the center cone. This was in 1970. Uh, and uh, here you have the major fishing village for the whole of Iceland that is here. And you have a volcano erupting in the backyard. <laughs> this was not good. And so this was the harbor to begin with that you can see there. Uh, and then this is what it was looking like. It was still erupting in 1973. Uh, but it buried a third of the town. And in fact, they got they had everybody leave. Uh, and, and it buried over 400 houses and buildings. And the, and the, the only people they kept on the island were the fire department. Because the lava flows that were going down, they cooled one side to force the lava to go this way instead of this way. And so they had it go out into the ocean. And, and what they did is they increased the size of the harbor 50% uh, by just forcing Mother Nature to have the lava flows go out in the other direction. Uh, and, and these islands are all less than 10,000 years old. So we climbed it, got to the top. I didn't have a chance to put the photos in. But the, the ground is still warm up there. And there are little fumaroles and steam beds coming out. So it is still active. And so here is a picture from the, this is from the vent that we climbed up, and there's the lava flow coming down yeah, into the town there. Uh, and so this is one of the older ones. This is the entrance to the harbor, as you can see here today. Now, how about the rocks? So anywhere you go, I'm a geologist, I always ask, what's the rock there? Well, I thought, my God, it would be awful to be a kid growing up there, because you know you make your little collections of rocks, and you're great with paint cartons and everything, because it would be basalt, 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 uh, and 80% of the country is basalt because it's on this hot spot that is there. But I, it was amazing because eight, there's still 20% of the country that are other types of rocks that are there. Uh, and I'm not going to get into the complex geology that you have got, but it is quite interesting. Uh, and a third of all of the lava that is erupted on land, in, uh, on the Earth's surface in modern history, so the last couple hundred years, came out on Iceland. So this is an active place. The island of Hawaii is another very, very high uh, area. Mostly scoria and basalt that we have. There, I put not ropey pohoi hoi, but I do have some pohoi hoi that is there. So when we look at rocks, you have light, uh, gray, and black. The black ones, uh, volcanic rocks, are basalt. So that's the common one there. This is andesite. This is what our uh, cascades are made out of, but they actually have a little of it. And they also have some rhyolite, which is here, which is more silica rich and so lighter in color that you have got. But when you go traveling around the country, you can just see layer upon layer upon layer. And many of the eruptions are just coming out of fissures, like you can see here. Uh, and as it comes out, as it cools down, it breaks and, and moves over on itself like this. That's what we call a, -a lava. Uh, and then you also have the ropey type, but it's not as common there as the a, -a lava. But I did find some. On, uh, in fact, the first day that we were out in the field, I said, there's a boy, boy, ropey lava that was there. 
Also, they have another one that we really don't have much around here. This is called the basaltic tuff. Uh, and uh, basaltic tuff, boy, that really got cut off, didn't it? Um, and, and, and so what happens is if a volcano erupts underneath a, a glacier, like it did in, in the last two million years in the Ice Age, what will happen is it will be very, very explosive and it will be very, very fragmental. And when you look at it up close, this is what it looks like. Big fragments, little fragments and stuff like that. And there are a whole bunch of deposits all around there. I've never seen anything like this, but it, it happens where you have a lot of glaciers uh, that are there. Uh, we got a, um, a chance to spend a day in the field with a very famous geologist, Haralder Sigerson. Uh, he is Icelandic. He uh, has been a professor at the University of Rhode Island. He's an oceanographer uh, uh, for the last uh, 30 years, but now he has retired. He's gone back to Iceland, spends half the year there, half in uh, Rhode Island. And so he took us out in the field. And, and it was absolutely wonderful to be out with him. But you can see here's the basalt flow, and then the lower part is very light in color. I said, oh my God, it should be dark. What happened? Well, this is uh, it's called mugarite, uh, and it is an alkali basalt that has a, a, a lot more feldspar in it, and therefore it is lighter in color, but it's still coming out of the same magma chamber. And for geologists, it's interesting, and you can see it's very, very flaky, and you have a lot of uh, uh, layers that are found in it. And another place, I, I, here is a rock that, is, that has the magmas coming up uh, through the throat of the volcano, it breaks off the walls of the rock around that. It's diorite. Uh, and it's what we call a xenolith. Uh, and so in a few places we would find these xenoliths and get very excited about that because, wow, that's not the type of basalt that you have in the area. But then also, anytime you have a lot of, of, uh, of basalt there, you have a lot of olivine and pyroxene. Those are the two major minerals in there. But when they metamorphose, they metamorphose into greenstone. And this is actually very, very green. It didn't come out very well. Uh, and, and so there is maybe 5% of the rock around there is greenstone. And then if you look up here, it should be black, but it's very, very light. And that is a rhyolite dome. Uh, and, the, and you say, well, wait, wait a second, Burns. You said that this is Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and it should be coming from the mantle and very, very dark. No, what happens is the crust is so thick. Here, over 50 miles thick because of this, this hot spot that is there. Some of the magma as it's coming up is distilled in the lighter uh, fraction, and the higher, higher quartz ridge comes out and forms these very, very violent areas. So there are not too many of them there. And then sometimes you will see red rocks mixed in with the black, and that is where the magma is going into the ocean. And as it goes into the ocean, it's rapidly oxidized uh, and turns into a red color. But the majority of the country, lava flow on top of lava flow, very, very boring geology, except for geology. Uh, and then you have a lot of what we call columns. Uh, and then we have a lot of these as you go up the Columbia Gorge. And so this is a lava flow, this is a lava flow, this is a lava flow. And what happens is this lava flow comes in, it's all liquid, uh, and then what will happen is it has to stop. And as it stops, it will cool from the top down and the bottom up. And as it cools in that direction, what happens? It constricts. It forms a crack. And it forms a polygonal uh, shape, uh, four, five, six, seven sided structure. Uh, and, and those are the basalt columns. And it has to stop. If it keeps moving, then it will uh, break up, and it's what we call entablature. But in, in the country here, this is where the hidden people live, uh, and where we would go traveling around the country. Oli, my good buddy, would say, Scott, you've got to be aware of what you say because we're close to the soft columns here and the hidden people might hear what you are talking about. <laughs> uh, and so we, you can imagine all the jokes that we had during the whole time about the hidden people, but you, wherever you go, and there are some great waterfalls. You can see us both underneath the waterfall here. Um, uh, uh, and then out into the ocean. Incredible um, columnar jointing in the results. And then as you get out into the coast, you get some incredible arches. And these are just loaded with birds. And the, the bird population is phenomenal in the country. How about, so we are on a tectonically active area. How about earthquakes? Well, they got them. Uh, every hundred years ago uh, or so, there is the big one. So uh, in 1784, they had about a 7.5 magnitude. That's pretty big. A lot of houses, farms, and everything destroyed. 1912, they had a 7.0. 
Uh, and then back in June of 2000, they had a 6.5, 5.5, 6.6. But they, ha we haven't, they haven't had one for over 100 years. So they're expecting the big one. Their big one is not as big as our big one. Uh, <laughs> we talk about 9.0. Uh, and so they're waiting for the big one right now, but they're tectonically active. So you've got a lot of hot magma beneath the surface. You've got a lot of water that is going to be percolating down into the ground. Uh, and then what will happen is that water is going to be heated up. It's going to boil and it's come back to the surface as either hot water or steam. And so you have geothermal energy. 85% of the houses in the country are heated with geothermal energy. It is wonderful. And most of the, when you take your shower, it smells like sulfur. Why? Because it's free. They pipe it into the cities and then it comes out uh, and it is wonderful. And then another thing, the, the national legislature said, we got all this free hot water, let's have swimming pools in every community. And they built like 125 to 150 swimming pools all around the country for recreation for the kids and the adults, etc. It's wonderful. Reykjavik, uh, what does that mean? It means Smoky Bay because the first settlers that were there saw a lot of steam coming out of the ground, what we call fumaroles. And so that's where the name came from. In 1930, they started taking the water from these hot springs, putting it into pipes, and then piping it into the towns. Uh, and some of them as far as 30 miles away. The world's largest geothermal station is, is there too, and we'll uh, mention a little bit about that. So wherever you go in the country, you'll just be driving down the road, see steam coming out, and that's a fumarole. Uh, and here's a hot spring. Uh, and, and this is hot, hot water that is coming out. And now it's interesting, and next to a lot of these hot springs, right next to it, you'll see a lot of greenhouses. And what they use is the heat from that and the water from it to create a lot of veggies. And so year round, you can get nice fresh tomatoes and lettuce and other things like that. Uh, and then they, they put it in the pipes and send it into the towns and, the, and it heats houses and it also is the hot water for the, the houses. And so wherever you go in the country, there are going to be pipes and there's going to be fumaroles with the gas, gas coming out. And you can see right here, there's a fault. Uh, and that's where uh, um, some of the, the gases are coming up to the surface. This is up in Bivatin. That's another uh, one, boiling water that is there. Fumaroles everywhere. Sometimes there's a lot of sulfur de uh, deposition. That's called the sulfur tar. And this is in the Bivatin area here. But uh, uh, pictures like this with these big, huge um, uh, pipes going everywhere, uh, generally the water is going to a geothermal plant or coming from uh, an area to get to the city. Here's one of the geothermal plants that you've got there. And this is in Reykjavik, and, and so it's all throughout the city. It's free water, free hot water to heat the houses. And then the swimming pools are everywhere in the country. But the most famous, the number one tourist attraction in the country, and I got a chance to go to it, I thought, oh, this is not going to be fun. It was fun. <laughs> and I tell you, go to it, and it, it, but it's not natural. Uh, and uh, there was a big power plant. Uh, and they, they were taking uh, and, and geothermal energy, and then they would take the cooler water and just dump it into uh, an area. And then pretty soon it formed a lake because a lot of the clays and everything that was in the water filled in the cracks and filled it in. And, and then pretty soon, a lot of guys that worked at the geothermal plant, at the end of the day, when they would get off, they said, let's just go into the, the, the pond out here. And they did, and they were loving it. And then they asked their friends from Reykjavik to come in. Pretty soon, a lot of people were using it. And pretty soon, they said, let's turn this into a tourist attraction. And they did. Uh, and, and the water comes out of the ground at 240 degrees Fahrenheit, two, two kilometers down. Uh, and it, but it's loaded with salt and minerals. Uh, and it looks like this, and so it's very, very well organized. You uh, uh, go in the dressing rooms and stuff like that. Uh, and I loved it, and you spend a lot of time. But if you look in the back of it, there's all this, this stuff that's over here. That's good, that's over here. But they have a pretty well camouflaged now. These are older photos that are there, and, uh, and, and it's lots of fun. And if you go there, they will, they will come around with mud. It's white mud. Uh, and you put it on your face, and you look, and they have white and green mud. And you get into it and say, what's everybody doing? Because it's all well, it's supposed to do things, wonders for your skin, and pull all of that stuff out. Uh, and, and it's really neat. And so, uh, if you get a chance, it's not, it's close to the airport. Uh, uh, and, and, but where do you go in the country? There are hot springs. 
uh, and it's all free, and it's just, it's absolutely wonderful. Here is a um, food roll area, and they were cooking eggs here, boy, they <laughs> could use it to cook, and uh, it's kind of fun. And mud pots, it, it's kind of like a mini uh, Yellowstone, wherever you go. Geysers, where did we get the term geyser? Well, it's Icelandic, it's what they put an eye in it. Uh, and, the, and I'll show you the original geyser, and so everybody in Iceland knew about it, it kind of stopped. But next to it is the uh, Stroker uh, geyser, which means the churning geyser. And about every five, uh, five minutes it goes off, and it's really an exciting one. Uh, what happens is you have got a uh, water source coming underneath the ground, uh, and the water is boiling, and then there will be some type of chamber in there. Uh, the, the, the gas, the hot gas is coming off of the boiling water will get trapped in it. And, and what happens is it's like a pressure cooker. The pressure builds up, up, up in this, in, in this um, uh, cavity and then it will push all of the water out and it will come out. And that's exactly what we think happens in Old Faithful and other geysers that you have got. And so uh, here is uh, uh, here is Stoker, uh, Stoker uh, geyser. Uh, you can see here, and it's, it's not as big as Old Faithful, but it is really nice. Uh, and then uh, here is the original geyser. Nothing's coming out. <laughs> but uh, I wanted to, and then people were wondering, why are you taking a picture of that one? Well, it's the original one, so I want to have a picture of that. And then also, you are very, very close to the Arctic Circle. And so when you get mountains that are going up to four, five, six thousand feet in elevation, when the snow falls, it's going to turn into ice, especially going from one year to the next to the next. So you have a lot of glaciers. A glacier is a moving mass of ice that is coming down uh, off of a mountain. Uh, and, and so uh, uh, this area has a lot of them. now. The first settler here was a guy named Ingolfleur Arneson. Uh, and he settled in the southeast part of the country. Well, when he looked up, he just saw glaciers everywhere. So what did he call the country? Iceland. All right, if he had gone around to the other side of the country, he probably would have called it something else. It's, it's really fun and interesting for me. Here's a country that is mostly green, it's called Iceland, and you go right next to it, and you have a country that is mostly glaciers, and it's called Greenland. Uh, and, uh, but it, for him, it was a very appropriate name that was here. 11% of the island is covered by ice that you have got. During the Little Ice Age, which was the last major uh, advance of the glaciers, starting about 1500 AD until about 1850, uh, the, the glaciers got down very, very far. Today, almost every one of the glaciers is in retreat, and this is in relationship to the, the climate change that we are going around the country. Now, the interesting thing is, most of these glaciers are on mountains. What are those mountains? They're, they're volcanoes. And when they erupt, that is a problem, uh, especially if it occurs underneath it. Vatniokel is the world uh, is Europe's largest ice cap. So there is Vatniokel, and so uh, it is huge. And uh, get a chance, uh, it, it's hard to get up to it. You can see all of the glaciers coming off of it, but if you get a chance to fly over, oh my God, it is really neat. And some of these other areas up here are also very big. I got a chance to go up with this one over here. But as you fly over it, uh, you just see huge, huge crevasses. Uh, and the ice as it's going down. And so, uh, if you get a chance, especially the southern part of the country, you go down the beak and then go along the south side, you see these incredible ones coming up. I love this. There, uh, here are the glaciers up here. But uh, all throughout the country, there are just these farms all by themselves. Uh, very, very isolated type of life that you've got. Look at this huge glacier <laughs> that is coming down off of this is a Vatniokel. Uh, this is also coming off of Vatniokel, but there are a lot of icebergs in the area. Uh, the day that we were here at this place here, uh, they only had one little boat going around in it, but uh, kind of fun. And then here's one. This is this is Vatniokel, and you can see uh, one of this valley has one. This one uh, there are about seven or eight uh, valleys in a row. Get up on the top. Just be careful where all the crevasses are that are up there, and another one. Here. So these moving masses of ice are absolutely beautiful. And they are the ones that the melting of the glaciers supply the water for all of these incredible waterfalls. Uh, and then another glacier there. You can see some off in the distance. I love glacier pictures, I'm sorry. But they're <laughs> now, uh, the rivers that are down below them 
uh, are what we call braided streams. And, uh, and, and so instead of having just one plane channel, they have many, many channels. The reason is at certain times they can carry huge amounts of water in them, uh, and other times not as much. Uh, and then you look at the, this huge, um, like, oh, that's okay. Uh, um, these are rivers at the end. And then um, there are a lot of fjords there. And these are U-shaped valleys that were carved out by the glaciers of the past. And then what has happened is sea level has risen and has flooded those U-shaped valleys. And those are what we call fjords. So that is a good Scandinavian uh, name that you have got. Uh, and so you, the, the greatest number of fjords are in the west side of the, the island, uh, and the, the west fjords, and then the east side of the islands. Uh, this is, again, up in the west fjords here. Uh, very, very steep valleys, nice UC valleys, and then you get over onto the, the east side. Incredible work. Not many people live out in these areas. Uh, and it's, it's sometimes a little difficult to get to them, but if you can, it's incredible. So, so when I was there, the, the first waterfall I saw was this one. I said, oh, this is exciting. Uh, and, uh, and this one it, it, it is a large lava field, and all of the water that comes into it comes in, out at one place along this river. It is a very, very beautiful one. But uh, I didn't realize that uh, the, the other ones are going to be much bigger. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is uh, another one, uh, which is, uh, this was the, uh, 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 Deadly, uh, not deadly, it's the uh, gods, it's the uh, waterfall of the gods. What would that be? Yeah. Good fun. Good fun, right, right. Uh, and then um, this one here is uh, my favorite. This is Gullfoss. And all the names are cut off, and I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, this is my favorite picture that I took there. Uh, and this is probably the most visited of all of the waterfalls here because it's down closest to Rick Huber. Uh, and you have one major uh, upper area and lower area. These are different basalt flows that you have got. And it's interesting in here because these are sediments in between. So it isn't basalt on top of basalt on top of basalt. Uh, and uh, you've got uh, sediments, that uh, volcanic sediments uh, that were formed in streams. Uh, and then waterfall after waterfall after waterfall wherever you go in the country. And the ultimate source of all of these are the melting of the glaciers in the highlands that you've got. This is coming down from Lockheed. Uh, and some of them, you just feel dwarfed. I mean, it is unbelievable the amount that you have. Uh, and uh, incredible. And then Gullfoss uh, is, this one. this is the one that I just showed you before from a different uh, position and waterfalls everywhere. Hydroelectricity is also another source of energy in the country. Uh, and because you have abundant rivers everywhere with an awful lot of velocity in those rivers, 73% of the power used in the country is electrical power. Where does it come? It's hydroelectric. Uh, and then the rest of it is geothermal. So they don't have to import any oil and gas except for uh, use in the uh, running cars and then also in the houses. And the first hydroelectric plant was built in 1904. Then. Now, there is an incredible name that we get from the Icelanders, and these are called Jokalovs. Uh, and this is a, uh, a huge flood that comes out of a glacier. And so a glacier, it has a huge plumbing system. And water is continuously coming in from the top into it and uh, in, uh, into glacial mills. And the, there are a whole bunch of passageways within the glacier and then underneath. And sometimes they can build out huge amounts of water within the glacier. But then if something happens, like the glacier moves a little bit, it can release all of that water instantaneously. Or if a volcano erupts underneath it, it will release an awful lot of that water instantaneously. And that's called the Yokohama. We call them in the United States just glacial outburst floods, or sometimes we use this term here that we have here. And so it, the, all of the rivers that are down from these large glaciers they tell people, don't live there. Don't live in the floodplains because you could be underneath 5 to 10 to 15 feet of water instantaneously with this. Uh, and, and, and we have them here, too. Mount Rainier, especially the south side glaciers that we have got. Where you'll see signs, don't camp next to the creek. Stay high up because the Yokel Alps will come down periodically. 
Uh, and the largest caldera that is found, uh, which is a very, very large volcano up there, um, uh, Mount Katla created the Yokolau that was 200,000 cubic meters per second, which is gigantic. That is a big flood. Uh, and so these, these braided streams that you see like this, you'll notice that there are hardly any houses in them. And the reason is the potential for these Yokolau they have. Uh, this is a valley that was completely carved out by a large Yokolau. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, this is another area where we were. We were going out to Denny Foss. Uh, and could not believe it. Just everything had been scoured away. Uh, and this is about 6,000 years ago that this flood came through. This is, we're talking about floods on the size of the Missoula floods coming through and uh, cubic meters per second. This is another one. This is also scoured out by one of these yokel outs that is there. Now, what happens when you have a volcano erupting underneath a glacier? Uh, now, these are normal, these are mafic volcanoes. They're mostly shield volcanoes, uh, and they are gentle giants. Uh, normally, what will happen is the magma will come up to the surface and just flow out, and they won't produce any ash at all. Uh, they may have a little bit of, of, of magma that goes up, and it comes right back down. There may be a few uh, cinder cones that are formed, but generally, nothing happens. But if the volcano erupts, underneath the glacier. It's what we call, a, it will melt the glacier and it will turn it into what we call a phreatic eruption. And it will produce huge amounts of ash. These are the dangerous ones that you have. Uh, and, and so, Hayafiet the Yokel started off as a tourist eruption. And I'll show you some pictures. And it was just over in this area of the, the, the volcano. And it was nice and everybody was up taking pictures. But you, you can get very, very close by. And especially at nighttime, beautiful pictures. I'll show you some pictures. But then what happened is the magma shut off there and erupted right underneath the glacier and created a huge phreatic eruption and with that, huge amounts of ash. Where did all that ash go? It went right towards Europe. And it shut down uh, all of the air traffic in Europe for six days. It cost $6 billion worth of loss of revenue uh, at that period of time. Uh, and uh, it, it erupted underneath about 200 meters of ice. That's what we call a phreatic eruption. Now, uh, and so Icelandic Air has a geologist that is on staff and uh, makes sure that they understand what's happening with all the volcanoes all of the time. Alaska Air also has a geologist on staff because they fly in and out of Anchorage and all over Alaska. And you don't want to have any ash because our volcanoes naturally produce ash. These in uh, Iceland have to be underneath the glacier. Uh, and, and so very, very important. Now, in 2000, this occurred in 2010. 2011, another volcano erupted. And we said, oh my god, the ash is going to be coming. Well, it was at the edge of the glacier. And most of the magma went up and did not get uh, involved with the ice. Uh, and uh, there was hardly any ash and very little effect. And it was just a so this is AFF Leocal. This is, this is the first part of the eruption. You can see it, there's no ice there. Just lots of, uh, here you can see the actual uh, uh, crack, the, the fault that was coming up on. And, and so it was beautiful. Uh, and, and you could get within just a mile of this. And it was, it, you didn't have to worry about it, it exploding. And at nighttime, you would get the magma coming down the sides, and great photos were taken. It's a very, very beautiful uh, one. And then sometimes you would start getting uh, a lot of uh, lightning. Uh, and so beautiful pictures. Uh, and it was, as some, but at this point, what's happening is producing a little bit of ash. Uh, and then what happened is it started erupting underneath the glacier. Uh, and, and look at this. This is all ash that is coming off. Uh, and where is that all? And look at here. So anytime you see white coming out of a glacier, steam. Anytime it's gray or black, ash. Not good, good. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so uh, here is the, the cloud. And where is it heading? It is heading for Europe. And, and this, now this is all steam. 
But then there's other stuff that is heading out. And so in Iceland, you, it was just like snow everywhere. And some of you probably remember when we got hit by Mount St. Helens uh, in June of 1980 when it came down into Portland. So it was a lot like this. So here's a the map. There's Iceland. And this is exactly where it came down, right to Denmark. Uh, and, 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 and then it nailed England and, and all the other Scandinavian countries right down into Lufthansa, uh, Frankfurt. Uh, and, and so uh, now we are paying a lot of attention to the volcanic activity that is in Iceland. Uh, and so this is, this is the tourist eruption at the very, very beginning there. All right, to end with, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about the plants and the animals and the humans uh, that are there. Uh, and, and so first of all, what grows there? You know, we're very, very close to the Arctic Circle. Surf, uh, circle. Uh, but there's still 200 species of grass, a lot of mosses and some flowering plants and some trees. Uh, but 95% of the forest have been cut. Why? Because they used it for, for, uh, for energy and for making boats and things like that and, and, and furniture and things like that. So few forests. They're bringing them back though. And I'll show you a couple pictures of that. Bir birch forests are being uh, planted and large pine trees. Uh, it's interesting, uh, cottongrass. I should have put a good picture in there. I got them from my mountain slides. Uh, but cotton grass is in all the fields. And why? Cotton grass tells you it's a wetland. And all of the hay fields are all wetlands. But what they do is they drain them. Uh, and then if you drain them, then they produce good hay. And that's very important because farming was the number one activity in the country until uh, the early 1900s. Then it shifted to fishing. And fishing is now, the, uh, now tourism is the main one. But uh, I started out doing mountain uh, alpine ecology. Uh, and so the, the two, two of the most famous uh, plants that we find up above tree line in the Rockies and the Cascades and the Alps or in the Arctic, the moss campion, Silena collis, and Dryas octopetala, the mountain dryad. Uh, and these were everywhere, and they were all in bloom. And I was, oh my god, look at these great flowers that are there. They're Arctic alpine types of varieties, and they're similar to what you would find in Europe and North America. Here you can see some areas where they are starting to plant trees and bring them back, and uh, maybe with time that, uh, they will be there. The other thing that it just blew my mind wherever we went in the country, there were lupins everywhere, all along the roads. Well, they were planted there originally uh, by the highway department. <laughs> to stop erosion next to the roads, and now they have taken over and they like the environment. They're very, very beautiful, but not natives. How about animals in, in the country? Well, birds dominate. Uh, and 70 species of, of birds breed here, and most of them fly in. Uh, and there are 25 different species of seabirds, and wherever you go, and they're all different types of gulls. And, uh, my favorite are the puffins, and, uh, right? Eight million puffins here. Oh. And they are the, they're the cutest little guys, they're, 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 they're big body and little wings, and they're just, they're laughing like mad. Uh, and we went out on a puffin uh, cruise one day. Uh, and, but very, very few perching birds like we have here. Uh, there are three American birds that come over in the summertime and, and breed there. The loon, brown's a golden eye, and the great northern diamond. Uh, and then also in the spring you have the golden pl plover, and Arctic tern. The Arctic tern is amazing because it spans the other half of the year in the Antarctic. It comes all the way from the Antarctic to the Arctic. They're like, wow. Uh, and then my favorite bird there is the ptarmigan. And it's a grouse. It's primarily on the tundra. And it turns white in wintertime. And in the summertime, it is camouflage. Uh, there are some birds of prey, there are some eagles, some merlins, and, uh, but Mibotten, the place that I showed you with all the geothermal, it is the land of ducks. Ducks everywhere. Why? Because you've got nice warm water. And the, the uh, most common one is the eider duck. And uh, if you've you probably heard of eider down, uh, those are your comforters. And that is, what they do is they take the, the under feathers of the ducks, and they get up to 2,000 pounds a kilo for those, uh, uh, for stuffing into comforters. Uh, and then also there are a few land animals. Uh, we didn't see any natural ones, but I will show you one in a second. Arctic fox is the major one that is found there. And, and they uh, uh, also turn white in wintertime. 
four rodents. There's the common field mouse and the long-tailed mouse and the brown rat. Minx, they brought minx in and they had it on farms and then they escaped. So they are now breeding and they are living everywhere. And they got over 3,000 reindeer uh, in the country too. And huge numbers of sea mammals that are there. Harbor seals, half of the world's population of harbor seals are found in Iceland. Plus, you've got all of the whales, the minky uh, whale, the humpback whales, and the main ones. We've got porpoises. You take boat trips, and uh, when we went out to Hamey, there were porpoises uh, following us along, and it was kind of fun. So one day we went out, uh, all of us got onto a neat old wooden ship, uh, got into our uh, coveralls, and we looked at puffins. Uh, and I, I took hundreds of pictures of them trying to fly, and they didn't turn out. So this is the best puffin. Uh, there's my picture of an Arctic fox. Um, that's the closest I got to seeing any was it was there. Uh, my favorite food there is the, are the small lobsters that they have there. They're called uh, lagostine. And uh, wonderful, 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 uh, and very reasonable in price. One thing that I didn't like, but it was part of the thing they wanted us to try, and that is shark. And what they do is they catch these very, very large sharks, and they cure them for three to six months. They hang them in the sheds like this, and then you can see they're kind of rotting down here and stuff like that. Um, and then you eat it. So here is Ole. And, and he's eating the, the shark, and this is a delicate, <laughs> delicacy, and they especially eat it at New Year's. Uh, and you'll notice that, oh, you can't see it, and I'm, I'm a lot of aqua beef down here, fire water. And that's about the only way that you can eat this. <laughs> and, and being the professor on the trip, I had to go first. And so, so I did, and I popped it in, and then took two aqua beats. <laughs> and uh, so, if you go there, be sure to have a little shark. Uh, you'll, you'll see lots and lots of hay fields everywhere. Uh, and why? Because they still do a lot of farming. Sheep everywhere, and you got to have feed for the sheep in the winter time, especially if there's going to be snow on the ground. Uh, and uh, all of these were wetlands originally, and, and now they've all been drained. They all were covered with cotton grass originally. We also saw a little bit of archaeology where you got here, and uh, you can see here that one of our stops, there are these big stones. Uh, and these are stones that the Vikings used to see how much they care, uh, could carry, and they're certain weights. Uh, and so there are names for each one of these, and you were stronger when you get the, the big one that is over here. I'll show you that. Uh, if you could hold that one up, you were a strong Viking. Uh, I was over in that the one. Off the chart. Off the chart. And one thing that I love uh, about Iceland is uh, all the Scandinavian countries used to be, you, your last name changed with every generation. If your name was Hans Jensen and you had a son Christian, he would be uh, Christian Hansen. Uh, and then, then if he had a son uh, named Soren, he would be Soren Christensen. And so your, uh, your last name changed for the males. And the females also changed, and you were Hans, Hans's daughter. Uh, and my cousin, uh, Thea Olesen in, in Denmark, gave me the family tree back to 1450. And it changed every generation, and it was kind of fun to get this. Well, they still do this in Iceland. And, and, and all the other Scandinavian countries, your last name was frozen sometime in the mid-80s. Tom, do you know, remember which year that was? It was about 150 years ago. 150, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it froze. Uh, and that's why you got a lot of Johnsons uh, in, in Sweden. And, 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 uh, but here they did. And so, uh, Brindis Thorstein thought uh, was a lady that became good friends with us, and uh, her, her name, uh, that's her last name. And in fact, you can see on, uh, on the gravestones, here's the husband, here's the wife, and they have different last names, because the, they go to what, that's her dad's last name, so uh, Eric's daughter, and then John's son. <laughs> Uh, I also, uh, they have like 10 golf courses there. Uh, and like, wow. Uh, they have to import the sand because it's light colored. And everything there is mostly dark colored. 
And then the Icelandic horse is incredible, very, very unique. It's a smaller horse. Uh, it does well in the climate there. Uh, and they, they breed them, and uh, they show them all over the world. Uh, also, the early houses that were there were the sod houses. And here's a sod church that they have maintained through all of these days. Now, all the homes are more modern, but in the old days, they had, that's what they had there. And I just love it that wherever you go, you're going to, especially in the east and west parts of the country, just not many people there. Brief history, a lesson in two slides for you. Um, uh, Pythias, uh, the, the Greek mentioned this far northern place back in the 4th century. He called it Ultima Thule. But back in the 6th and 7th century, the Irish monks started coming over. Uh, and then it went... It, in the mid-1800s, you had a mass exodus uh, from uh, Norway, what is now Norway, uh, to there. Uh, and uh, the official first guy uh, was uh, Ar it should be Arneson. Uh, and they were on the southeast coast, therefore the name Iceland that came up. And then the first parliament, it was 930, that was the thing to learn. Uh, and uh, and then, um, that was the oldest democratic parliament that they had. An interesting thing happened in 1000 AD. At the parliament, they decided to make the whole country Christian. Uh, and because they, they had been monks there for many, many years, and a lot of, a lot of the leaders had been uh, um, uh, affected by this. But one thing that it did was the, the Viking language was not written down. It was not a written language. It was all oral. At the parliament, every year, they had a guy that had memorized every one of the laws, and he could stand out in front and recite them continuously the whole time during the parliament. But when they, when they became a Christian country, the monks brought in a written language, and written language, and Icelandic was born at that time. Uh, and then with time, they, they eventually broke away from Norway, went over to Denmark. I put in here over Heime, the the island with the, the volcanic eruption. A huge number of pirates came into that in particular area. Then, 1873, that was the Lockheed volcano when 10,000 people were killed. Uh, and then, um, uh, in 1854, the trade monopoly with Denmark. Everything had to be traded with Denmark, and they could trade with anybody. But still, they were connected. But in 1944, the war was still going on at that time. Uh, they they severed the ties, became independent, and Iceland became a country. I wanted to put in here, uh, because the first female head of state in a democratic country for the whole world was in Iceland in uh, uh, 1980. And, uh, Anna, can you pronounce her name? Nudis Finnbogadóttir. Thank you. Uh, and, then, uh, and then 2008 was the recession, the whole world, but uh, Iceland really had a problem. And wherever you went, you talk, people talked about uh, uh, what they had to go through and had to suck it up. But the thing is, the, the country, the, the five banks kind of uh, made too many loans and, and didn't go well. They stuck all those guys in prison. <laughs> all the guys who run the bank. <laughs> Uh, and we went by the prison. It's up in north, the north part of the state. It's still there. Uh, and, uh, and, and another thing is, here's a country of 320,000 people. They still have a phone book. And everything in the phone book is by your first name. Not your last name. And so I was working with Oli. And he would call people up on the phone. Hi, this is Oli. Not only Magnuson, it's just only. And I mean, every, and everything's on a first name basis. I love that. Uh, so for me, Iceland is a paradise. It is a geologist's paradise, it's an ecological paradise, it's a country with a lot of clean energy, uh, and an incredible place to visit. Here is Thingvalir. This is where the, the Mid Atlantic Ridge is here. You actually could go uh, skin diving, uh, not skin diving, uh, 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 you could go diving with a wetsuit on out there in the middle, and, uh, and you can see what's down at the bottom of the Mid Atlantic Ridge. So I'm encouraging you, hopefully, I, the reason I wanted to do this was to teach you a little bit about life. Wonderful place. Ecologically, geologically, culturally, and the people are just marvelous. And Iceland Air now flies into Portland now. And, yeah. and they, they will be flying from April until October, two days a week, 
Uh, and it, Isomir, just like it was when I went to Europe back in 1970, is a cheap airline. I mean, you have to pay for everything on there, and it, they don't have the free food and stuff like that, but uh, it is a great one. And if you fly, it, and all the flights go here to Reykjavik, and then from Reykjavik either on to Paris or London or Stockholm or Copenhagen, etc., they fly to 30 cities in uh, Europe and 30 cities here. But they will allow you to stop in Iceland for one to seven days for free. I mean, no, you have to pay once you're there, but I mean, don't, you, they'll write it into the ticket, and most people do. And this is a way to, they have increased the tourism in the country amazingly well. If you want to stay for one day, you can go over to uh, uh, the Blue Lagoon and go to Gold Moss and to the Geyser and uh, places like that. Or if you want to take two or three days, you can go out to Ame and other places like that. It's fun. And I encourage you, if, next time you go to Europe, stop off in Iceland. See a little play, bit of this incredible place. Also, when you get on, ask the pilot's name. My cousin, Pala, is a pilot. Tall, <laughs> <laughs> tall, blonde guy. And are you Pala? And, uh, and uh, it, it's interesting because almost all the pilots are, are Icelandic. He's Danish. Yeah. But he's married to an Icelandic girl. And she was a flight attendant for another airline that he was working for, and they fell in love. They got four beautiful little daughters. Uh, and so now he uh, uh, qualifies as being Icelandic. So if you do that. But I encourage you to get out and see a little bit of this incredible uh, Scandinavian country, Iceland. Thank you very much for coming out.